My name is Dr. Kren. I'm an assistant lecturer here at the University of Pretoria, and I'll be reviewing a series of neuroanatomy lectures with you. Today's lecture is on higher mental function. Okay, so here I'm going to discuss the anatomy of the higher functioning and how it fits into the picture. I will also do this before I'm going to zoom into the specific syndromes governing higher functions, which will be the second part of this talk. So we can refer to this as the primary dichotomy of cortical organization. So this is a broad outline of the presentation that I'm going to give. So we're going to start off with the neuroanatomy, and then after that, I'm going to look at the spectrum of higher functioning disorders. That's going to govern aphasias, apraxias, as well as agnosias. Okay, so I think we all know that the cerebral cortex is comprised out of gyri and sulci, and the larger sulci will derive some of these gyri into subsequent lobes, as we can see here. So this is exactly the same picture as the previous one, except that it's a medial view of the lobar organization of the brain, with some color coding of the different types of lobes that we get. Okay, so I'll just broadly talk about the functional organization of the cortex, and then I'll talk about the more specific areas of functioning. Starting here, we have the frontal lobe coded in red. So closest to the central sulcus, we have the primary motor cortex that functions in an organization of motor behavior. Just anterior to this area, we have the premotor areas that is associated with premotor planning and skilled movements. Moving more anterior in the frontal lobe, we have the prefrontal areas, and these are involved in higher level cognitive processes as well as thinking. Here in the inferior frontal lobe, over the pars orbitalis, triangularis, and opercularis, we have Broca's area, which is involved in expressive language. Up in the parietal lobe, shown in purple, just posterior to the central sulcus, we have the primary somatosensory area. And just posterior to that, we see more of a heteromodal sensory association areas. The temporal lobes is shown in yellow. And in the superior part of the temporal lobe, we see vernicus area for receptive language. And just below that, the supramarginal and angular gyrus. And then we also get the auditory cortex in the superior temporal lobe. And that's shown in green, is the occipital lobe, and is associated with the visual cortex. Okay, so showing some areas of more interest in the frontal lobe, again, just anterior to the central sulcus is the primary motor cortex, which is lying next to the premotor or supplementary motor cortex, which is an association area. And just anterior to that, we see the frontal eye fields, which is primarily involved in eye movements. And again here, we see the frontal prefrontal cortex that is associated with a variety of higher cognitive executive functioning. And this also contains a number of different association areas. Again, shown here in the inferior, inferior frontal lobe, on the left, we can see Broca's area associated with expressive language. So moving on to the parietal lobe, shown here, just behind the central sulcus is the primary somatosensory cortex located at the post-central gyrus. This is preceded by the somatory sensory association areas. Here we can appreciate the supramarginal gyrus, and at the top of the superior temporal sulcus is the angular gyrus, which is associated with lesions that are collectively called Kurtzman syndrome with problems in writing, calculation, finger agnosia, and right-to-left right disorientation. Although some authors associate the this syndrome with the nearby supramarginal gyrus, but I will get into this much later on. Moving on to the temporal lobe, here on the superior posterior temporal gyrus, we have vernicus area. And here in the middle of the temporal gyrus, we have the temporal visual association areas. The inferior temporal gyrus cannot be seen. And here in red, we have the inferior temporal pole, which is clinically important as it is most suitable to traumatic injuries. Other regions in the temporal lobe that can be seen here is within the sylvian fissure. And this includes Herschel's gyrus, which is the primary auditory cortex. I've highlighted it here in red for you. In the occipital lobe, we can see this calcarine sulcus, around which we find the primary visual cortex, 
which is further surrounded by the visual association areas or higher level visual cortex. Okay, so looking at the myelo architecture of the calcerine, we find a thickened outer band of myelinated fiber named the band of Bilager. And this band is visible to the naked eye and gives the primary visual cortex its name. Hence, it's called the stria of Janari. So now I'm going to briefly look at the connecting systems of these areas, as it plays a vital role in higher functioning connecting each of these systems to each other. So there are three primary different connecting systems in the white matter. These are the projection fibers, which are fibers that travel to and from the cortex. Then there are the commissural fibers, which contains connections between the hemispheres. And then lastly, there are the association fibers, which mediate connections between the cortical areas within a given, hemi given hemisphere. So now I will give an example of each of these fibers. So shown here are the projection fibers, which travel to and from the cortex. The best example here would be the internal capsule, which runs from the motor cortex to the brainstem and the spinal cord. And it is shown here in this axial section of the brain, showing the anterior limb, the genu, as well as the posterior limb, which continues then down to the cerebral peduncles. So looking at the commissural fiber, which is a special type of projection fiber that mediates connection between the hemispheres. And I'm showing the three main examples here, highlighted in red, which are the anterior commissural fiber, which connects the temporal lobe to the amygdala, with the olfactory disassociations that occurs via the lamina terminalis. Then we have the posterior commissural fiber, which connects the pretectile midbrain nuclei, and that is important in the pupillary light reflex, and contains the drachenwich as well as nucleus of cajol. And then the corpus callosum, which is by far the biggest set of commissural fibers, that in the order of magnitude have the greatest number of connections than any of the other commissural fibers combined. The commissural fibers that is not shown on this picture is the habenular commissural fibers, which forms the stalk of the pineal gland, and then the hippocampal commissural fibers, also known as the lyre of David, or the crura of the fornix. And again, shown here is an example of the commissural fibers, now on an axial section, where the anterior and posterior commissural fibers can be seen together with the subsequent neighboring structures. Now looking at the association areas, which are long cortico-cortical connections within the same hemispheres, and some of these are shown in this diagram. And this includes the superior longitudinal fasciculus as well as the inferior longitudinal fasciculus. The cingulum, which neighbors the singular gyrus, as well as the uncinate fasciculus. And importantly, which is not shown in this diagram, includes the arcuate fasciculus, which connects the dorsal prefrontal cortex with the superior temporal gyrus and lesions which can, in this area, can be associated with a conduction aphasia. Another example of association fibers are those that are called the short fibers or the U fibers that connect one cortical area to another. And usually these fibers are unnamed, but they may be specifically spared in specific diseases like the leukodystrophies, and therefore they might be of clinical interest. They are also seen commonly involved in demyelinating conditions because they've got a high energy output, these fibers, and therefore they are typically affected early on in disorders like in multiple sclerosis that causes demyelination. So they affect these white short fibers early on in the disease. Great, so that concludes the neuroanatomy section. So next up, we'll look at what higher functionings are and how to diagnose the subsequent disorders.